Are you also tired of data science jobs getting reduced to simply prompting an LLM? Do you think it's a bit sad that unless you work at a big AI research lab, knowing how to send an HTTP request is probably more important than knowing what a loss function is? And by the way, if you work at a big AI research lab, please contact me, uh, just so you know. Um, but anyways, that's why I'm traveling back in time to a period when you had to manually implement your own backpropagation algorithm in order to train a neural network. And so the goal of this series is to challenge myself and implement a small neural network framework in C++ so I can get more understanding about both the technical and also mathematical foundations of deep learning. So if you also want to understand neural networks in a deeper way, I promise at the end of this series you will have learned a lot and you also don't need to be an expert to follow this series as I will be implementing everything from scratch anyways. The first question some of you might be wondering is why I am going to implement it in C++. Well, I wanted to use a lower level language as this forces me to also learn about the engineering principles behind neural networks. And as almost every machine learning library, such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, and sklearn, um, also the, in those libraries, the heavy mathematical operations are not implemented in Python, but they are done with C or C++ bindings. So C++ seemed like the obvious choice. I can already hear some of you wondering, why not write it in Rust instead, as it's also a lower level language, enforces memory safety, prevents race conditions, and has a compiler that gives actually useful error messages back. Well, hey, if you feel like wearing a helmet while cycling, think you need to wear some sunscreen if you go outside for a few minutes, or if you want to wait for a green light at a crosswalk, Rust is definitely a good language for you. But if you're not scared of any memory leaks, a way too complex build system, being able to access arrays out of bounds, and want to learn a language that actually produces commercial value, you should consider C++. And before I'm going to do C++, I will first show you a small project in PyTorch, which will demonstrate all the functionality that we want to support with our neural network framework. PyTorch, as you probably know, is a machine learning framework which makes it very easy to implement and train neural networks using Python. As a dataset for this example and also to test my own implementation of neural networks in C++, we will be using MNIST and it's more difficult drop-in replacement fashion MNIST. Both datasets include black and white images of 28 by 28 pixels where each image belongs to one out of 10 possible classes. In MNIST, these classes are the numbers between 0 and 9, and in Fashion MNIST, the classes are clothing items such as t-shirts, trouser, or dress. Although nowadays these datasets are uh, considered hello worlds and are very easy to learn by our algorithms that we have these days, but back in the day, in the 90s, the MNIST dataset was considered a serious benchmark to compare various machine learning algorithms. With PyTorch, the, we can easily load these datasets as follows. We can then define, we can then divide our dataset into batches using a data loader. Let's now quickly write some code to visualize our dataset and check that everything is okay. PyTorch also has easy GPU support, and in my case, the GPU of my M1 Mac is correctly detected. I am now going to define a very simple neural network, which first flattens the, to the, uh, the two-dimensional input image into a one-dimensional array, so that it can be processed by the layers of our neural network. I'm going to make three linear layers with ReLU activation functions in between. As we need our network to predict one out of 10 possible classes, the, the dimension of the last layer is also 10. We will associate each of those 10 numbers with a single class of our dataset, and we will consider that a higher number means that the network has more confidence that the input we processed belongs to that specific class. We are then required to also implement a forward pass, which is very simple in our case. It just takes a single or a batch of images and applies all the layers. This basically come down, comes down to a lot of matrix multiplications. You 
probably already learned this in high school and it's pretty cool to realize that something as relatively simple as this is what powers even the largest neural networks like ChatGPT. I define a cross entropy loss function as it's good at multi-class classification problems and basically measures how bad that the network is at classifying or amnest image images. I also create a stochastic gradient descent optimizer which is responsible for optimizing the weights of the neural network such that the loss function decreases which means that the neural net gets better at the classification task. Now we just need to implement a training loop which goes through all the batches of the training set, passes the images of that batch through the model, calculates the loss function and adjusts the weight of the neural network by calculating the gradients of each weight such that the optimizer can adjust them and that the loss function decreases. I also write a test function which iterates through the test set, passes a batch of test set items through our model, computes the loss. We also compute the accuracy this time by considering the largest number of the output to prediction of the model. So now that everything is ready, we just train for a certain number of epochs while also tracking our performance on the test set. As you can see, training a small neural network goes very fast even on a M1 MacBook. And after a while, we're getting good performance and accuracy on both the standard MNIST dataset as well as the fashion MNIST version. PyTorch also provides methods for easily saving the weights of your trained model and loading them back in so you can do this and um, do some additional inference on the model later. If you've never used PyTorch before, this can be all very confusing and seem like some dark magic is happening. From a machine learning class in college, you might have for example remembered that deep learning is about matrix multiplications, calculating gradients, probabilities, backpropagation, but in PyTorch we don't see any or at least have to implement any of that. We can just call loss.backward followed by optimizer.step and PyTorch seems to magically optimize the correct parameters of our network. So to find out what's actually happening, we are just going to re-implement all of this PyTorch functionality that you see in this notebook ourselves in C++. I will do this completely from scratch, only using um, the C++ standard library. So this for example means I only have access to a simple vector class to store the weights and I will also have to implement all the matrix operations and differentiation logic myself. If you're only used to languages such as Python, C++ can be intimidating and seem very scary. For example, instead of just declaring x equals 5.1, you have to specify the type of the variable and there are lots within the standard library. For example, even if you know that you need to store a floating point number, you still have to choose between float, double, long double, depending on how much precision you require. You also have to manually manage your memory and decide whether you want to allocate a new object on the stack, which is faster but automatically destroys the object when the function in which you created the object returns, or if you want to allocate the object on the heap, which allows the object to live longer than the function which you created it, with the downside of also having to remember to actually remove that object from the heap or else you will run out of memory. With all these squiggly signs, you can also make variables hold memory addresses instead of the actual object. So you can just pass around pointers to objects instead of the actual object. And in order to run your program, you also have to first compile the code to a language specific to your machine. So you might be wondering, we are not longer living in the 80s, you old fool. Why bother with all of this when I can just use Python? Well, the main upside of C++ is speed. Because after compilation, we are directly executing machine optimized code rather than running the code with an, an interpreter. And also because we are manually managing the memory instead of relying on a garbage collector, C++ is in general much faster than Python. And maybe the most important reason that you can flex that you know C++. 
So let's get started and for this video we will just quickly set up a new C++ project for our neural network framework. I work on a MacBook so I'm using the CLang compiler for C++. I then install the C++ extensions on my VS Code editor, install a debugger, install the CMake extension for easily compiling my projects within the VS Code UI. I also need to set up this CMakes, uh, CMake lists file which determines how my project actually needs to be built. So I need to specify which C++ version I want to use, that I want to use the Google test framework to run my tests, where the source files can be found, what the entry point of my program is, and where my tests are located. Let's also set up a formatting file so that everything looks nice. Now to verify that everything is working, let's quickly implement a dummy C++ program and dummy test, configure my project, compile everything, and yes, everything seems to be correct. Unfortunately, this is it for now, as I want to keep each video relatively short and understandable so you don't fall asleep. In the next episode, we will start by implementing the tensor class, which is the building block of all neural networks. So if you're interested in following along and seeing how you can build a framework like PyTorch, you should consider subscribing. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think about this series and I hope I see you in the next video.